The 1990s were a great era for Nerf, because we had things like this, the Whiptail Scorpion. This crazy contraption is actually a Nerf Blaster, and it came to us from none other than the Max Force line. The Max Force line, of course, was taking elements of animals and using their essence, using some of their likenesses, and turning them into a Nerf Blaster. There got to be some really wild designs, and it was popular enough that it saw a series sequel with the Max Force 2112 line, which was just a more extreme version of the animals grafted onto Nerf Blasters. Considering YouTube was not around back in 1996, I think it's only fitting that we give this a proper review and talk about what this does really well, what they've changed over the years so that Nerf Blasters perform differently. Of course, we can wax nostalgic about just blasters from this era, because they were so, so, so good. All right, let's get into it. Let's talk a little bit more about the Whiptail Scorpion. I think we start our discussion about the Whiptail Scorpion with the very 90s design. We have some just very bright, loud design elements that just gives you a sense of when this was created. And that's one of the things this blaster does really well. It gives it a very great design that I don't think you can pull off nowadays, but looking at it as a piece of retro or vintage nostalgia, it just works really well. And you can tell Nerf was in its infancy just due to how small the handle is on this thing. An oversized grip to fire the dart, and this was really a toy made for a kid. There was nothing performance-based or geared or designed for this thing. You see these legs on the side of the Scorpion can be taken off, and from what I've gathered from other people, and I didn't think of this when I was a kid, but they use these as Wolverine claws in Nerf battles, which kind of gives you some insight as to why we don't see claws or sharp objects on Nerf blasters all that often anymore. And something like this is often how you will see a Whiptail Scorpion. Missing the legs completely or just one side, these don't necessarily stay on all that well, especially well, 30 years basically down the road. There's just a very small retention clip right here that plugs into the side and you have to be very ginger and careful with it because, I mean, this has seen some decades. And if you get really close to the camera here, you can see on the armored body of this thing, there are some texture design elements alternating between sections. It's really, really cool to see up close. And we haven't even talked about the tail of the scorpion yet because this is probably the most interesting, the most fascinating part of this entire blaster. And that's because when you squeeze the trigger, it curls the tail and it gets the dart post in place to fire one downrange. And it does that in a very unique way. It has this tube right here, the air hose, and it's attached to this piece right here. And when I squeeze the trigger, you can see it retract into the body of the blaster and it pulls up this plastic bent piece that then allows it to curve and fire a dart. It's incredible this thing works at all, let alone 30 years later, because if you look at the back side of this, you see how it's put together. There aren't any hinges on it. It's just a weakened area of plastic that's allowed to flex. And the way these little clamps hold onto the hose, they're offset just enough that it allows some clearance for them to curl in on itself and get the dart into position. So we know where the dart fires from this blaster and kind of how it gets into position. How do you fire this thing? Well, you take this whole bronze claw piece at the front, you pull it out, and now it's primed. Now, as you see, it's fully primed, and the plunger, just based on how everything works, you know that it's pointed this direction, so it loops around. Ultimately, you're not getting a very strong or direct performance from it, but again, we're thinking in the 90s, this is how they were supposed to be. It's supposed to be more toyetic. I'm gonna take one of these old school darts here, I'm gonna put it at the end, we're gonna see how this thing flies. Now, all I have to do here is just squeeze on this oversized trigger. Everything goes well, the dart is gonna fly that direction and not just plop down right in front of my feet. <laughs> Here goes nothing. There it goes. Uh, I'm surprised that it did that. It actually hit my light, so I'm gonna aim it a little more off to that direction and see if that works a little better. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else you can expect from something that's like around 30 years old. I'm just surprised that darts are flying out of this thing. That was a dart designed for this blaster. What if we use a more modern dart or, you know what, let's just go half length dart. We'll see what happens there. All right, we have a worker dart here provided by Out of Darts, thanks to them. 
Let's see if that even fits over the part here. It does very slightly. Oh, wow. Okay. We'll see how this is going to go. Get it loaded. And that actually flies a lot better than the old dart. I think part of the reason is the old dart is pretty crusty. It's well used. It's well worn. It's well loved. It is not a fresh dart by any stretch of the imagination. Whereas that worker dart that I had was brand new. I think it might have been fired twice in its life. So the air seal was a little better. You can see that the hose clamps right around here. I don't know how well this is holding up after 30 years. It looks still pretty good, but I wouldn't say this is very soft rubber anymore. I'm going to have to be very careful with this, as I have been, to make sure that it keeps working in the future. Possibly for another 30 years. That would be the ideal. So if somebody gave me a magic wand and let me design this blaster from scratch, knowing what we know now in Nerf world, right, I would definitely make this tail have hinges. It's going to give it a little more flexibility. It's going to give it a little more longevity. Continually flexing the plastic, it's stressing it. And at some point, I wouldn't be any sort of, like, shocked if it were to crack and break and just fall apart. I don't necessarily think that they were planning on somebody reviewing one of these 30 years in the future. Another thing I would have done a little bit differently is increase the air volume to this, maybe either having a bigger hose or just a shorter tail so that you weren't losing enough air power there so that the darts could perform a little better. And while I definitely appreciate the onboard dart storage right up here, a few more darts somewhere tucked on this blaster would be nice so that I could just top it off and fire some more. But I think compromising on those things would take away from what makes this blaster just charming at this point. And if you're looking for a blaster like this to add to your collection, or you come across one and you're wondering if it's worth the pickup, here's a few of my tips. If you see one of these and you're like, ah, do I take it or do I not? So if you want a really good condition one, make sure that the sticker is still seated right there at this circle point right here. A lot of Max Force blasters that you find out in the wild, thrifting garage sales or whatever, the sticker will be ripped, it'll be missing, it'll be kind of half off. This one, it was in phenomenal shape. That was, you know, thumbs up to find that, and then that was kind of an immediate yes for me. The other thing that you're gonna be looking for for this is making sure that the air tube right here is in relatively good condition. And what that means is that the tubing isn't too hard and that it still has some flexibility with it. Speaking of flexibility, you're gonna to wanna to look at the backside of this blaster and make sure that all of these stress marks right here are just that, stress marks, not fractures or breaks or tears. And then lastly, to make sure that you have a complete whiptail scorpion, you have both the left and the right legs. And then from there, you just wanna make sure that everything else is rather clean, there's no deep scratches, gouges, and that it can prime still. Deeply curious about what the system looks like inside the blaster, but I'm never gonna open this thing at this point. It's just too old, and I wouldn't trust myself to put it all back together in proper working condition, especially with things like the tail being so fragile. It's easy to say they don't make them like they used to, but in fact, if you look at some of the recent Nerf blasters now, either from Nerf or from all the competitors that have cropped up in recent memory, they still make them really good. They might not have the silly gimmicks, they might not have the sticker sheets, they might not have the rad extreme 90s vibe, but we still have examples of those blasters. And uh, I'm living proof that you can still find 30 year old Nerf blasters in amazing condition. And whenever I come across them, you can be sure that I'm really proud and happy to add them to my collection if they are in good working condition and order. But if you like Nerf blasters, both old and new, action figures, toys, and collecting things, really appreciate it if you gave me a follow. That's it. That's all the time I have for the Whiptail Scorpion today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.